This is a MapleSoft digital education podcast. I'm here with Dr. Farino today uh, to discuss online education. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. So generally, maybe let's start with uh, how would you define e-education today and sort of what's your background? How did you, what brought you to this point? So I look at e-education pretty simply as just digital assets to support learning. So I didn't get involved in e-education until 2010. I must say that I never had any expectation to be involved. By 2010, I'd already been teaching almost 30 years, uh, some at high school, mostly at university, and I have to say I was um, intensely dissatisfied with lectures. And we've been teaching that way for a You're couple saying face-to-face -face lectures? Face-to-face -face yeah. lectures. Me in front of 60 mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. 80 or 120 or 200 kids. And we've been teaching that way a long time, whether it was Chinese sages or Greek poets. But somehow I felt at the end of a class, even though I enjoyed it and the kids were attentive and present, they didn't actually learn very much. And so there had to be another way, a better way to teach. And one of the things that e-education helps is, well, I'll back up. So John Dewey said that uh, we don't uh, learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. And that part, that reflection actually wasn't happening so much in the classroom, at least in my classroom. I'd stand up and go wah, 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 and uh, students would transcribe, but we didn't reflect. The availability of digital assets would allow students to do something beforehand and come into the classroom and then we could reflect on what they learned. So solving a system of linear equations. So I'm a mathematician, it's something all of us learn how to do. Um, it's relatively simple to do but when kids come into a classroom then you can ask about mm, does this algorithm that you tried work all the time? Uh, if it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? Can you prove that it works all the time? When do you use it? And I think it was that kind of ability uh, that simply wasn't present in the classroom that was one of the motivating factors. So you're making people think that that's not fair enough. I remember one time I was in a, a statistics class and I actually at night I looked at my notes and I'd copied the same board of notes down twice. twice. And I <laughs> so there was absolutely no, no engagement or comprehension. So you're actually trying to get people uh, engaged. Uh, so, so that's how you would define it? I mean. It wasn't, I mean, really, even though, as you said, online learning goes back a number of years, if you define it as you did, that it's just tools to help the educational process. But it really got popular in, you know, 2010 to 13 time period where MOOCs came out. And, uh, and I think the driving forces were more on cost savings and a, and, uh, a scalable tool. Where I think today, it, that's no longer enough. It has to be better, uh, you know, a better educational experience or learning more in a given time. Uh, like, what, what do you find to be the most effective things to, to, to um, bring in engagement? Like, a, yeah, like if there's one thing, or the 80-20, what are the, what's the 20% thing that you can do to really cause students to be engaged? So I think if I had the right answer, I'd be rich and famous. Yeah. So we've been teaching for... As opposed to just handsome. <laughs> <laughs> you lie so well. Um, we've been teaching for several thousand years, and we haven't got this one figured out. Um, a digression, uh, in part because I'm an associate dean, so money is important. Um, we've been teaching roughly the same way for a long time, mm -hmm. which means our... Since we had books, roughly. Perhaps even before yeah. the, in the oral tradition, um, we actually haven't done real well on the cost efficiency of our education. We still have one very expensive person at the front surrounded by a group of students where we are passing things on via the oral tradition. So when I think of how we can become uh, more efficient in teaching and in learning, uh, I think focusing more time on doing mathematics, not simply doing mathematics, but on reflecting on the doing ma ma of mathematics. So uh, student is asked a question, uh, provides an answer, gets some feedback on the question, and then can do something related. 
Uh, maybe they didn't get it right and they get to try a simpler variant of the question or uh, clarification. So the doing, 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 lots of doing. And I think we can do that in the domain of explicit knowledge much more efficiently digitally uh, than we could in the past. Because you could have done it in the past, right? I mean, you could have said, read chapter two, and then for the entire class, give them quizzes. Ab absolutely. And um, if that had worked, we'd all be out of a job yeah. in the education sector because the libraries have spectacular books and wonderful collections, well-written with well-chosen exercises. So that's actually not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's that extra part of the 20%? Some of it, I think, is the feedback. I can do the answers in the back of the book. That's not the same as, uh, sorry, I can do the questions in the back of the book. That's not the same as doing the questions and being provided with some feedback. Mm -hmm. The other thing that digital allows for some people, ironically, is that we can maintain the human connection. So we're very social beings, we humans. And I think very few of us can simply pick a book from a library shelf, begin at page one, and read 400 pages of group theory yeah. and say, yes, this is. Uh, so having a human who interacts by, in any form, right, that question and answer platform or Skype, uh, makes a big difference. If I can communicate with classmates and ask, okay, so here's a difficult problem. Here's what I can bring to the problem. What can you bring to the problem? Uh, we do that physically in class, but we can also do that digitally. And some people would argue nowadays that it's easier to do digitally because students have become accustomed to mechanisms like social media to yeah, communicate. Yeah, it's interesting. Most people would have said, you know, online learning is actually moving away from the human-to-human -human connection. But, uh, but I, I do agree with you that ha just having a instructor who cares about your progress is a big part of that social equation. You know, that someone is watching you and you are either going to be judged as doing well or doing badly is a big piece of it. And it doesn't have to be face to face. I do think the human connection is really important and it's something that we will have to work out uh, more effectively as we spend more time with digital assets and e-learning. Uh, but I think we ignore it at our peril. No, by just want to define a bit of you know, what you mean by the human connection because I fully agree with you that education is very much about your social environment and you're feeling part of a club you know, and you have cl classmates you can ask questions and reach out to. Potentially you know the professor, potentially you don't. You know. um, but that's different socially than in the actual learning experience. Yeah, you know, I suspect, and I think it is the case that most online students today, they still want to have that connection to campus, you know, and it's not necessarily in their learning materials per se, you know, it's sort of the clubs and the associations and stuff. So, so what do you mean? Uh, so I'm thinking specifically about the educational package, the course where I think that connection is important. Now, like, so if you're interested in, in your students doing well, where do you place sort of the, what's in the course versus the broader social, you know, uh, being part of, uh, you know, of U of W math, you know, like the, the, you know, even, even the, you know, the, the brand or the, uh, you know, being recognized as one of the smartest mathematicians at one of the best math schools in the country. So group identity is important for sure. Some of that will come by not the course but the program and you're right, the package of yeah. things that goes around the program. In some cases it's going to have to be done by academic advising which can happen inside the course but in many cases will happen outside the course and that can take the full suite of questions that would arise from anybody who's on campus and you have the same set of things to, to worry about. But I do think the ability to ask a human and get a human answer I get a potentially human to with answer, with your fingers, though. but yeah. potentially with fingers or over the phone or yeah. Skype or, but I need to believe that there's someone on the other side who's made an emotional commitment to me, and then I make the emotional commitment to them, and part of that emotional commitment is to the program and the content of a specific course, and that makes a difference. Let's talk a bit about 
tracking, tracking of comprehension as students move through the materials. Um, I don't think, I, I think one of the things that digital assets or e-learning systems give you, gives you today, is the ability of getting this very fine grain tracking data. You can see how much time a student is spending on every topic. You can see their comprehension level if you're testing them along the way. You can have allow them to rate it, you know, whether they like it or not. Um, I don't think we've ever really had that. Like even practically, you, you could give a quiz, but someone has to mark it in the past. And there's a very long feedback loop. Now you can have this not only instant feedback loop, but you can really track the progress of of a class. You can compare them. You can measure education that you like in a way that you could never measure it before. How do you, important do you think that simply that measurement? ability is to e the education. So I'm going to back up to a much coarser level of measurement mm. and the effect of asking a question. So if I'm the student and I'm being asked to integrate this function, um, there's already a substantial amount of learning happening by you asking me the question and me answering the question and that's reinforced by feedback. So this is very well established in cognitive science. So simply being able to ask the question and give the social expectation that the student is going to give an answer now, uh, that I'm going to write down an answer now, is going to help me be a better student. It's going to help me learn. It's going to help me retain what I've learned. Be able to so recall. Even, yeah. even a course measurement uh, is useful. I think we're just beginning to look at the broad analytics uh, we clearly need to think about the efficiency, the efficacy of what we're doing. So being able to say, um, here's a set of content that we prepared, here's a set of questions that we hope will assess how well students have learned that content. We need to judge whether the content is any good. We need to judge whether the questions, in fact, measure uh, what the content is hoping to teach. And we need to measure whether the student is learning. But that requires large volumes of content over many instantiations of learners and that's something we can only do now in the past that's right in the past we simply couldn't collect the data you, you truly have big data yeah so you, you it should allow instructors who care to identify which pieces of their content is working well you know quickly effectively uh, versus uh, what isn't working, where, where students are spending too much time or where they're skipping over. Like, so there's a great deal of data that's going to be available. Um, where do you think we go with it though? I mean, do you see the ability of doing like true AI tutors and you know, once you have all this data available? So when um, the first reboot of Star Trek had Spock, young Spock in this learning pod, and that was presumably driven by artificial intelligence. I think we're going there, not next year, not five years, but I think we're, we're going there. I think we have to think very carefully about what measurement is going to imply. Because when I think of mathematics, many of us think of measurement related to explicit knowledge. Can you integrate this function? Can yeah, you solve this yeah. uh, system of equations? But I'm not sure that it's very good yet at measuring the tacit knowledge or the ability to integrate uh, all that we've learned and approach a novel problem and say, how do I go about this? Those strategies that would have come from substantive time solving problems, working through bodies of, of uh, mathematics or anything in STEM or any discipline, Mm. And so I, it's not clear to me yet how we measure that set of deeper skills. Because like my definition of comprehension has always been, can you take a topic you know, that you've just been presented and apply it to solve a novel problem? And like can you take presented data and apply it to give, you, to give an answer? Um, you don't think that's enough? So, I, so the problem for me is when I think of most of what we teach in mathematics, it, it's relatively well-defined. 
and there's a well-defined answer and there's a well-defined approach. So let's suppose uh, the question is an unsolved problem. Uh, how do we measure the quality of approach to that problem? Yeah. Um, or suppose the problem has lots of solutions. How do we measure the efficacy, the generalizability, uh, the abstractability of a particular solution or class of solutions? Um, how do we say that this algorithm works spectacularly here but doesn't generalize very well when we change the problem by just a small amount? And so in the domain of explicit knowledge, I think the measurement's going to work very well. Yeah. I simply don't yet know how we're going to... Uh, and of course, time is an interesting variable there, because not only do you see that the answer is either right or wrong, but you see how long it took, which might be some of your you know, efficiency of getting to the answer. Um, yeah, should someone... Does someone have a better understanding if they've taken... 30 seconds, and someone else has taken three hours. Uh, maybe, yeah, or maybe I not. I, actually, I think that's a great example because I, I think one of the problems I had when teaching in a traditional way was um, the students wouldn't ha actually have worked on the class of problems we were going to consider in advance. I just start at the top, theorem, uh, proof, mm -hmm. or definition, theorem, proof, example. But students actually weren't given a problem and said, mm, how would you approach this? And struggling on the problem. I think in that act of struggling on the problem, they queue up the past information they would need. They recognize the things that they don't know. Um, they may or may not have attempted various uh, approaches or heuristics to solve the problem. But I think they're queued in a much better way, a much a way which allows them to learn in, in a much richer manner than theorem proof definition definition theorem proof mm -hmm. for example, but that takes time, and depending on what one measures, that could be considered lost time. That it might be more efficient to go straight to the definition theorem proof. When I think historically, for example, in mathematics, this notion of limit was used informally uh, by Archimedes in the Greek classical period. It was used maybe a little more formally uh, in the early modern period. But even after Newton had used it quite well, it was still a couple of hundred years before we came to a definition. So that act of definition theorem proof example undoes our historical approach in the way we actually learned the material as mathematicians. So I'm not convinced that the way I taught for so many years is in fact the best way to teach. And it, it may in fact be better to start with a problem that people struggle on, they spend lots of time with, and then when they're primed, we can begin the teaching. A, a, and each person may be different, of course, too. They Th that's true, different absolutely. Approaches. So, absolutely. But I, I do think you know once we have the, uh, this amount of data, where you're teaching the same subject potentially in different ways to lots of students, you know, 10,000 students worldwide. Uh, there is an ability of um, automatically selecting a path based on what a student has done before where he can learn that material, material more effectively. Or at least that would be my hope of what we could get to. And that's what teachers do. If if I've been your student for months or perhaps years, uh, you would have a pretty good innate understanding of my approach to the world. And you would almost certainly choose problems and material and content knowing my specific background. Yes, yeah, if you were that closely connected and you right. didn't have a class of a thousand kids, right. and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's sort of, you know, this is tangentially related to competency-based learning. Um, should I interpret what you're saying that you think we're, that might be a dead end, you know, that it would be very hard for us to get to a um, you know, level that you need to learn these items and once you've done it, you're done? Uh, you know, because it, it, yes, yeah, let, let, 
you so I actually th I think there are we learn uh, for different settings and competency based learning is typically in a setting where there's a prescribed content and I have to demonstrate typically by some, yeah. some test some proficiency with that content and I think e-learning is superb for that and uh, I know that amongst academics there's often some reluctance to support competency-based learning, but if I'm an employer uh, and I can, be m I can be more efficient in the use of my employee's time and their ability to learn the material, that's a no-brainer. And so I, I expect we'll see lots of competency-based credentials out there. So, in the not so why, why do you think the, the lack of acceptance in academic circles? Because where this leads to, and I think it's a very inter interesting place, I mean, a, a great deal of obtaining a degree is spending this prescribed number of hours on the course. Um, and that seems almost barbaric, like, or, or at least out of date. You know, like if you can truly measure someone's comprehension and what they've been through at a sufficient level, you know, why shouldn't someone be able to do a degree in, I don't know, three months, you know, versus four years, uh, if they have the ability of doing that? So, you know, the time base for your learning, 